everyone, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Hudson, respected colleagues, thank you for joining us today. I am so honored to introduce to you Ms. Camille Jagmanis. She's been with the Institute for the last six months, I believe, 6 February 2011, and is going to present her research to us today. She brings a wealth of field experience and academic work to inform her research and we are so privileged to have her here today. She, has, she is a uh, communication and development specialist. She has worked in Lebanon, in Kosovo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina for French and Lebanese governments, for the United Nations. She has a degree in, she has a Master of Philosophy in Development Studies and a Master of Arts in Communication. And she has a degree in Law, Lebanese Legal System. It was fascinating to learn that during the war of July 2006 in Lebanon, Camille was working for the Lebanese Ministry of Information for Radio Lebanon, and she was a field uh, correspondent. So, uh, and her field work there at that time is going to inform her presentation today, which is basically about two Muslim and Christian communities in Mount Lebanon, the Shi'i and Marana. And she tells us about the long history of cultural uh, cohabitation between these two groups and how the new development, political development, have used the new space, as far as I understand, to manifest this long cultural practices through socio-discursive practices, new practices, and new practices, and semiotics. And also she tells us how these are different from two new counter-movement organizations. One of them secular and the other one religious. So, before taking much more time, please help me welcome to you. for this very kind presentation. Thank you all for being here today and for honoring me with your presence. Um, this is a presentation uh, on Hezbollah and its Lebanese context, uh, studying the alliance with the Christian Maronite Free uh, led by uh, the Mission on the Maronite leader, the Free Patriotic Movement. We will look together um, at this um, phenomenon uh, based on uh, two themes. The first one would be to introduce to you the nationalist current led by Hezbollah in the stream of Mumana'a Axis and uh, that was consolidated after, after the July war in 2006. And the second theme is looking into um, the political entente between the two parties that has transformed into a political alliance grounded socially and generating a new political space, actually both uh, coalitions, post-Syrian coalition, coalitions, March 8 and March 14, have achieved to create transnational sectarian, trans-sectarian national uh, territories in Lebanon. But we will see in the conclusion that this, um, this geography is still fragmented as, uh, and it has been revealed as uh, a result or an implication consequence of the Arab revolutions. Uh, I must, because Lebanese uh, politics are very complicated, uh, we should start with a small uh, chronology. So Prime Minister Hariri was assassinated, assassinated February 14, 2005. Um, and uh, of course, uh, demonstrations of anger uh, started to, um, uh, to increase in the streets of uh, Beirut and Saida asking for the withdrawal of Syrian troops. 
As a consequence, in March 8, Hezbollah organized a pro-Syrian rally in downtown Beirut via the Saleh Square um, uh, to support the Syrian presence uh, in Lebanon and the Syrian uh, alliance against mainly uh, the Israeli um, enemy between brackets and and uh, as uh, in reaction, in, in March 14, an anti-Syrian uh, rally was um, it was a call actually by uh, the the politicians who represented this, the current, but the demonstration was not organized, and the people who demonstrated in this rally were uh, went on a free and a, a personal decision to the street to rally on the 14th of March and asking for, ask for the Syrian withdrawal from Lebanon. Syrian troops withdrew for, for Lebanon in April 2005 and notified a final withdrawal in April 26, 2005. And um, a week later, uh, su surprisingly enough, the uh, parliament in Lebanon uh, did uh, settle on the 2000 electoral law. Uh, which is um, a um, uh, dramatic decision because um, they were um, uh, reiterating the electoral law that was um, uh, put uh, by the Syrian, uh, Sy Syrian occupation in Lebanon in favor of uh, the Syrian allies in Lebanon. And these uh, electoral uh, recommendations were to um, organize the, the first free elections to be held uh, in May 2005. Um, a week later, Michel Aoun, a Christian leader, uh, came from his French exile in May 7, 2005, and elections uh, were held May to June 2005. Uh, the, the second surprise came when uh, Hezbollah and Amal, so uh, if you look at the chronology, part of March 8 uh, rally um, did a pact of alliance with um, Wali Jumblat and Hagiri who are from March 14, the anti-Syrians. So they, they uh, went for electoral uh, alliance to secure seats in the parliament for all parties. And then um, uh, in July to, uh, uh, 2005, another Christian leader, warlords, previous warlord, uh, Sami Jarja, was released from prison. Now, uh, in 2005, parliamentary, uh, the, uh, the, the participation to the election was uh, very high. Um, uh, en moyenne, uh, about 50%, uh, very intensive in the region of uh, Jbeil, where uh, on uh, took the majority of the seats we will uh, see in the following uh, in the following uh, map, actually. So uh, these are the results of the first three elections. Uh, you can see in the orange col color uh, the seats that obtained massively uh, Michel Aoun in the region of Village Bay. In the south and Balba Kermen, am I going too fast or is it okay? Because we should. So in this. and the uh, allies who got the majority of the votes and then you can see future movement and the uh, uh, party uh, led by Wali Jumblad uh, taking the Shouf, Beirut and North uh, Lebanon. Now, um, the other uh, intriguing or uh, something you need to understand to follow uh, Lebanese politics is that Despite the, the pact that was contracted between Hezbollah, Amal, and uh, Hariri and Jumblat, when they, when they secured the, uh, their parliamentary seats in the parliament, they went to, uh, to be organized again between a majority of March 14 and an opposition of March 8. So you can see that March 14 obtained 91 seats, and these are the parties. Aon is included in the March uh, 14 block as part of the majority, as much as Hariri and Wali Jumblat, and Hezbollah, Amal, the Syrian Nationalist Party, 
and others were in the March 8th uh, alliance. Now to continue with the chronology, in uh, following the, uh, the elections in December 12, 2005, a governmental crisis was triggered by a um, disagreement over a treaty, the, the cabinet uh, pro, uh, specifically um, with the majority of March 14, but with no particip participation from own coalition in the cabinet. So there was a crisis uh, triggered by um, over a treaty, disagreement over a treaty related to the scope of the special tribunal, uh, UN that tribunal uh, that would investigate and handle the assassination. So the the majority uh, wanted the treaty, wanted the, the special tribunal to look into the assassinations that occurred uh, during the last two years and uh, Hezbollah, Hezbollah uh, and the Amal uh, uh, ministers uh, disagreed with that and stopped participating in the cabinet uh, uh, meetings. So um, this is when uh, this, uh, a, poli a political crisis started and the country was paralyzed. In February 5, 2005, um, Protests were prompted by Danish cartoons um, of the Prophet Muhammad and they spread in the Christian district, district in Tabaris and in Ashafiye. Why am I mentioning this event? This is uh, a very important event because this happened under um, a government that was led by mainly Hariri and the allies. And the call for the demonstrations was organized by the Sunni and uh, uh, to demonstrate in front of the Danish uh, consulate, which is located in Tabaris, a few meters away from the former Green Line, Western Beirut. So this is a Christian district. And when uh, the demonstration uh, turned to become violent, uh, by vandalism and churches were vandalized, <coughs> buildings were bur burnt out, it was perceived by the Christian as an intrusion in their districts and it was perceived that March 14 are not able to secure anymore uh, the grounds um, in uh, the Christian districts of Beirut and this is when the very next day uh, Oman signed a memorandum of understanding with Hezbollah. Um, and then we have the July uh, war that was triggered, triggered on July 5th. So. <laughs> Sorry for this long introduction, but um, so why am I showing you this map that was produced by uh, Lev Kafai, former uh, intelligence uh, for, uh, people who used to work with the Mossad? I'm using it to pinpoint to highlight with you three aspects. The first one is this general stress of war that uh, Lebanon went through during July, August 2006. The maritime, aerial, and London embargo <coughs> that were exercised over the country, and also the bombardment of the civil uh, national infrastructure. And uh, also, I wanted to see with you uh, the uh, concentration of the Israeli bombardments that indicate the military bastion and social infrastructure of Hezbollah. So you can say that from these concentration points, in South Lebanon, in Baal Bak Hermel and in Dahye, uh, that the bastion, uh, military bastion of Hezbollah and uh, social uh, infrastructure in terms of schools, supermarkets, hospitals are concentrated in these areas. Um, also, I would like to see with you the weaponry that was used by Hezbollah during that uh, war because it incarnates uh, the Trans Asian coalition uh, that Hezbollah benef benefits from. So um, the Israeli gunboat was hit by say, CO2. Well, they say it's made in Iran. Actually, it's a Chinese design. And uh, Iranian revolutionary guards had Hezbollah to fire this rocket. And um, also, uh, the rockets that went to up to 30 kilometers inside the Israeli territories are Russian-made. These are Katyushas. And then those who went over 45 kilometers are Zenzel, Zenzel rocket made in Iran. And uh, the rockets were also launched from uh, 
uh, Russian-made trucks, mobile Russian-made uh, trucks, uh, most lethal weapon used by Hezbollah at that stage was the anti uh, anti tank uh, rocket that disabled or uh, destroyed the Merkava, which is supposed to be the most uh, sophisticated uh, uh, tank uh, of the Israeli army, and uh, these uh, very uh, sophisticated rockets were Russian made. We know also that uh, uh, North Korea is involved in the technology that is used by uh, Hezbollah and uh, shipped through uh, China. Now, I would like to see with you the map of the population internal displacement uh, in Lebanon during that war. So, the Shiites who flee uh, south of uh, Lebanon, uh, it, uh, at a certain point, it and very quickly, it was very hard to circulate on the coastal uh, road because it was hit by uh, the Israeli army. So they fled towards Baal, Baalbek and Hermel uh, through uh, the Bika. Yeah, they, they uh, to, and to Syria. Those who were in Dahye went to the public spaces in Beirut. Here you can see people gathering in a garden, but also they went to convents and to schools. And um, also, uh, some of them in, uh, went to Mount Lebanon. So this is the interesting part, because for those who are familiar with the demography of uh, Village Bay, they know that there is a Shia population in that region, indigenous Shia population, that was not displaced during the civil war. And uh, people who have relatives in this area went to seek refuge with, uh, to, with their relatives. But also, we have these two villages, Af'a and Lassa. These are squat villages, that uh, shared, purely shared villages that are built on the church, undivided uh, property. And uh, this is where it's on the uh, uh, it's on the on the other side of the mountain of Baalbek. Okay, and there is a, a new. A road that was built linking Afa to uh, Baalba. So, Lassa and Afa uh, witnessed a big change, a demographic change during uh, the period of time. And also, uh, you <coughs> notice in Lassa and Afa landscape a uh, massive presence of Hezbollah. Usually, this is where Amal forces uh, have their posters with Nadim Berkeley and Musa Sadr. But since that time, we started to see flags for Hezbollah, uh, the Islamic resistance, uh, and um, a, um, the, the, the villages started to expand uh, also. Um, you should know that no gathering in public space was noticed, and no permanent mixed neighborhoods were created after the war. So people who could rent a hotel room or an apartment, they did it in Ferdinand, Faraya, uh, and these are uh, seasonal uh, touristic places. Why do we consider that the July War uh, contributed to the nation's consolidation? It's because uh, there was a political coordination at national level. This is a picture showing an Israeli little girl dedicating a rocket for the Lebanese uh, children. So uh, this was perceived as um, a foreign aggression against uh, the Lebanese country. And um, there was a political coordination that has preserved the trilogy of the army, Hezbollah, the nation Hezbollah, and the resistance. Meaning that the army didn't retaliate against the Israeli uh, aggression. Uh, the resistance, Islamic resistance, Hezbollah did fight, and the nation uh, Help out to uh, to to get out from this crisis. Um, there was a consolidation of the national uh, territory as a result of the territorial practices and uh, classic level as much as just uh, regional uh, social networks were revealed. Um, ceasefire was declared by UN Security Council August 11 and it was uh, implemented by, the, by Hezbollah and Israel August 14, 2006. Uh, people uh, returned to their place of origin 
and more than a month later, Hezbollah organized what is called, what they call, the Divine Victory Rally on the 22nd of September. This is a picture showing 500,000 people gathering in, the, in South uh, Beirut to celebrate this uh, Divine Victory. Uh, and Hassan Nasrallah gave a speech uh, in the open air that day. And um, among the, the crowd, you can see people from Amal, from the Hezbollah Qawmi Suri, from Hezbollah, and also from the Christian uh, party, the Free Patriotic Movement. Now, uh, why do we say this was the invention of the divine victory? Because there was a debate in Lebanon over why, whether it was a victory or not. And uh, Hassan Nusrallah declared in his speech on the 22nd of September that victory was sub subjective in that sense that those who were literally, literally, he said, those who were happy, satisfied with the outcomes of the war were considered as victorious. And we, he said, we including Hezbollah and all who share this feeling, feel like we have won the war. And why is there a debate? This is the headquarters, this is the part of Beirut where uh, the head, security headquarters of Hezbollah is uh, supposedly, uh, was supposedly located before the July war. You can see the, the aerial uh, picture before and after. So the, the destruction was quite massive. Um, now, Hassan Nasrallah, um, to lead the national current did share the victory with um, the, the Lebanese people, the Palestinians, and the Arab Ummah. And uh, clearly he said that this nationalist uh, current is in the access of Mumana and against the new project uh, for the Middle East that was uh, introduced by Condoleezza Rice. Um, he invited the Lebanese people, whom he described as uh, fragilized by uh, regional and sectarian identifications to rally for a common cause. Now, we, one would uh, wonder how come um, an Islamic resistance can gather a heterogeneous crowd, even if they were not defeated by the July war and even if there is a social uh, base uh, for uh, this nationalist current, how can an Islamic resistance, clearly religious resistance, in a country that has been through civil war, uh, lead a nationalist current? This picture can show you, uh, so there are two aspects I would like to highlight to, to explain this phenomenon, the cult of the individual for Hassan Nasrallah and the coming uh, 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 speech of Hezbollah as a, a party. Um, in, in this picture, you see a common sheet woman uh, holding the picture of Hassan Nasrallah. People are throwing flowers and rice. This is a sexy lady, Nasr min Allah, meaning victory is from God, but also Nasr Nasrallah is from God. This is during the elections, so you can see that obviously it's not a big woman wearing the icon of Hassan Nasrallah. And this is another type of more militant. Uh, uh, woman, we are all resistance, Kuruna uh, This is a, a supporter of Aum uh, who is wearing Hezbollah flag. This is a typical Hezbollah woman, partisan. And these are uh, the, those who are trained for war, and these are supporters of uh, Amal. Okay? So, uh, actually, uh, self representation through Hezbollah is not monolithic. Supporting Hezbollah may have several meanings. To talk the resistance, national unity and sovereignty, social movement and its struggle to assert the rights of a community that sees itself as helpless, adherence to the religious dimension of the social project, these different types of membership converge on some points and help create a diverse community around Hezbollah. As an orator, Hassan Nasrallah is far more capable than any Lebanese politician of bringing a Baroque crowd together. So these are the two aspects that uh, I highlighted in my paper. Now, um, Hezbollah has also a very important ally uh, 
the FPM that is led by uh, previously General Michel Aoun, currently MP Michel Aoun. Uh, Michel Aoun uh, has his relation to his uh, supporters has transformed over time. Uh, there was a time where we have witnessed the cult of the individual. This is when he was in uh, Baabda. Uh, fighting against uh, the Syrian presence in Lebanon for independence. But when he came back from his exile in May 2005, his, his crowd was waiting for him with Lebanese flags and the same enthusiasm for his idealized persona. But uh, however, he came back with uh, a party project thriving for modern and secular states. As soon as the freedom of association was restored, he, um, he declared officially the Free Patriotic Movement in September 2005. Soon after, he was dragged into local politics and engaged in the Democratic Party, and Aoun has diluted in the partisans' aspirations and ambitions. Um, so, uh, little did he lose partisans for his political decision to, uh, regarding Hezbollah and Syria, but most of them were disappointed by the undemocratic practices within the party itself. Uh, part of Michel Aoun electorate left him for the political choice he had made to join Hezbollah in the National Park. Now, this is how you can... Uh, 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 ...categorize uh, the supporters of Aoun. You have the, uh, the active partisan coordinators and those who are registered in commissions the voters who are registered on the FPM database and the non-partisan electorate, people who would vote for him without being identified by the party's database. Uh, these people, and most of those people, are uh, briefed um, uh, permanently by SMS and regular meetings uh, um, about the uh, Political, uh, on which he makes about the political decisions of the party. Uh, they have also, of course, the forum of the party uh, on the internet. Uh, whenever there is a very delicate uh, issue, uh, they uh, call people for actual meetings and briefings, and uh, mainly. Now, we are getting to the second part of our presentation which is uh, understand the political alliance between uh, Michel Aoun and Hassan Nasrallah. So this is the secular party, the flag of the secular party of Michel Aoun, and this is the flag of Hezbollah, saying, فَإِنَّ حَزْبَاللَّهُ هُمَّ الْغَالِبُونَ Hezbollah shall be the winner. الْمُقَوَمَ الْإِسْلَامِيَةِ لِبْنَانِ The Islamic resistance in Lebanon. Uh, here is the slot. Do you remember I showed you two pictures of Beirut uh, before and that. So here is the slot, and here is where the two leaders have met in February 6, 2006, meaning a few months before the July war, war start, was started. Uh, they met in that place to sign together a memorandum of understanding. It addressed ten main points, seven of which laid the principle and actions necessary to the post-war reconciliation and state building, two of which were related to the Lebanese-Palestinian and the Lebanese-Syrian relations, which the last point dealt with the weapons of Hezbollah, the Israeli occupation of Shab'a farms under the theme of protection of Lebanon and preserving its independence and sovereignty. Overall, one should understand that the memorandum of understanding did uh, consolidate, consolidate both interests. Hezbollah was seeking for legitimacy not to be reduced to a Shia militia in Lebanon, and, Hassan, um, and uh, Michel Aoun was seeking for the empowerment of the Christians in Lebanon. So, these are uh, the, the points that were uh, discussed in details. So, we are talking about national reconciliations, meaning national dialogue and covering the fate of the missing during the war and the location of mass graves and ensuring the return of the Lebanese residing in Israel. And then uh, we have uh, the principles to build a modern state, um, to adopt a consensual democracy. This is important because this is the point where uh, they uh, pretended that they were uh, signing a national pact. No minority, no majority. 
the city consensual in democracy, and uh, they uh, seek to implement security reforms. Uh, with Syria, they confirm sovereignty, independence, and rejection of any form of foreign tutelage, uh, and uh, to be the foundation of mutual and sound relations with Syria. Uh, regarding the Palestinian refugees issue, it was quite ambiguous the way uh, the MOU was uh, written, but uh, uh, mainly Palestinian settlement in Lebanon was rejected by both parties. A lot of ambiguity on the Israeli weapons because the uh, wording of the MOU says that the practice of weapons outside the camps needs to uh, be put to an end. So we don't understand really if they would like to disarm the Palestinians inside the camps. And then um, together, so this is the part, the only part that is very important for Hezbollah, they recognize that Israel is still occupying the Lebanese farm of Shaba. So this is the point that would allow Hezbollah to uh, uh, ask to remain as a resistance in Lebanon, because if Israel is not anymore occupying any part of Lebanon, there is no point to have a resistance. So, uh, previously, for those who know Lebanese uh, history, uh, uh, there was a deal to say that Israel has completely withdrawn from Lebanon and that Shema farms are Syrian. So this is where the parties are saying, no, Shema farms are Lebanese, and Israel is still occupying Lebanon. So, and this is where there is a whole uh, deal uh, that is, is uh, uh, preserving the legitimacy of Hezbollah and its weapon. So, um, back to the chronology. So, this is when they signed the Memorandum of Understanding. It was a political entente. During the July War, the solidarity that was deployed by FPM partisans toward the Shia population that fled uh, to Mount Lebanon consolidated uh, the political entente. But most important is uh, that date when the Shia uh, ministers resigned from the cabinet and together Hezbollah with uh, FPM uh, became in clearly in the opposition. So this is how the, this uh, the seats were redistributed in the parliament uh, with regards to these new coalitions. March 14 was still a majority with 71 seats. Anand coming down with his uh, few friends uh, to join March 8 alliance. Okay? Now, um, FPM together with Hezbollah uh, had joint political actions since November 2006 up to May 2007. So they organized together a sit-in that lasted from December 2006 to May 2008. This sit-in in downtown Beirut was announced in a demonstration October 12, and it generated space and time for socialization between the groups and the participants were Christians, partisans of the Free Patriotic Movement, Shia partisans of Hezbollah and Amal, Christians from the North, partisans of Sayyid Kanjil Mahada, and the Syrian uh, Nationalist Party. Uh, also, they organized together a general strike in January 2007, and this, this is when uh, they have had tested the trans-sectarian continuity on the Lebanese territory. And uh, also they achieved together Doha agreement that was mostly in favor of uh, the uh, FPM inquiries. And it was in line with the MOU. So just to give you uh, an idea, this is how the city in, in downtown Beirut looked like in the beginning. It looked like a big Gallic feast uh, in the beginning. It was a space that favored socialization between the groups. We have pictures, this is a picture showing people relaxed, training, uh, playing, having uh, their dinner, socializing, but, uh, sorry. So, uh, having, I have uh, interviewed a uh, few um, um, high members of uh, FPM, and I was informed of uh, 
uh, emblematic marriages that occurred uh, following uh, this long uh, sit-in, but I didn't have the opportunity to interview the people who got married, so I can't tell you more about it. Um, okay. So, uh, this was a space for socialization, but, and it lasted from December uh, 2006 up to May 2008. But one month after this general uh, sit-in was organized, uh, the two um, organizations, FPM and Hezbollah, called for a general strike in January 2006. And uh, they blocked the main entrances of main cities. And this is where we had, we had clashes between pro- and anti-government uh, supporters. And this is where we could see the weak points uh, on the Lebanese territory and the strength uh, points on the ground uh, of this uh, coalition. Just to tell you, uh, in Beirut, we have uh, witnessed street clashes uh, uh, that day and onwards in January 2006. And for those who are familiar with uh, Beirut, these streets that are uh, indicated on the map are all uh, mixed Shiite and Sunni neighborhoods. To compare with the former uh, Green Line of the Civil War, uh, all these districts are on the western side, beyond the Green Line that has divided previously Beirut. Uh, Ras al is uh, on, uh, immediately located uh, on the western side, beyond the green line of, uh, that has divided Beirut during the civil war, and all other districts were towards the no man's land or the west, uh, western part of Beirut. During uh, this long uh, period of political crisis, Lebanon witnessed another pocket of insecurity, uh, Nahr al-Bayed, the Palestinian camp that is uh, located in the north, that was infiltrated by an uh, Islamic organization called Fatah al-Islam and they had a, a long war that lasted from May to September 2007. The Lebanese army had um, uh, bombarded massively Nahd al The Palestinian refugees were displaced and um, uh, the, 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 the end of the war was declared in September 7, 2007 with the army, of course, uh, winning uh, the battle. But after uh, this fighting that occurred at Nahr al all the Palestinian camps were distressed. I used at that point to work in UNRWA, the UN agency that is uh, taking care of the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. And uh, I went uh, afterwards to Burj al Barajna, which is supposed to be the most peaceful Palestinian camp uh, in, uh, in the Beirut, at least, and in the region. And uh, Burj al Barajna had dramatically changed uh, after the incidents of Nahr al Barid. Um, it was not anymore uh, clear who is controlling the camp, and circulation in the camp was not anymore as safe as before. Uh, also, uh, so you should know that uh, January 2006 onwards, Lebanon was uh, experiencing street clashes frequently until it experienced a mini scenario of civil war in May 2008. It uh, started with uh, a general strike and it ended up with Hezbollah taking over Western Beirut. Now, uh, I want you to notice that, uh, to look at this uh, man and see that he doesn't look like a street fighter, he looks more like a fighter, like a trained fighter with weaponry. This is a map uh, of Hezbollah uh, taking, uh, taking over West, uh, Western Beirut. You can see that uh, they could take over all the districts that I showed you previously in the map, the clashes that were occur occurring frequently in Beirut. Okay, 
that were uh, populated by mixed population, he took, Hezbollah took over all these districts, plus all the uh, media uh, stations that belong to uh, the future uh, the future movements. I'm also showing you this this are mili uh, Hezbollah military fighting in the region of the Shuf, and this is Tripoli. So you can see that Tripoli, uh, Jabal Mahsen and Ben Kudrani fight. Uh, fight the fighting looks more like a civil, uh, civil fighting, more, more than uh, a fight between trained soldiers and civilians uh, wearing weapons. So this is a map of the Lebanese clashes that occurred from January 2006 up to May 2008. Uh, so typically it was between Jabal Mohsen and Dabi Kibbeni. You can see also, so this is uh, the camp of uh, Nahir Bayrid, uh, Beirut, the uh, mixed districts, and uh, in Shouf, uh, the problems occurred in the regions that are at uh, uh, the limit of uh, the, the Druze concentration and the shared neighborhood. The clashes in May 2008 ended up with Doha agreement and during this agreement uh, the electoral law in Lebanon was to be changed. So we will have a look together at the new territories of votes uh, in Lebanon um, uh, resulting from the Doha agreement. This is how we put dist electoral districts were organized uh, in 2000 and this is how the uh, district, district, districts uh, were organized in 2005. Uh, mainly uh, the new uh, decoupage uh, favored um, the Christian district and uh, overall uh, it is uh, clearly that uh, the electorate of March 14 uh, votes massively in uh, Beirut. Also, um, so uh, in 2000, uh, after the Doha agreement, the electoral constituencies were smaller, and in this uh, country where all institutions are uh, based on sectarian uh, distributions, uh, having smaller electoral constituencies meant that uh, the communities to, are choosing their own uh, MPs uh, and this was mostly beneficial for the Christians. But if you look at um, the election results, you can see uh, as usual a high uh, geographical and political specialization. Again, South of Lebanon is for Hezbollah, Baalbaq and Temple, Hezbollah and allies. Amun is still in powerful in the same region and uh, the block of uh, March 14 is still powerful, powerful in the same region. Actually you have huge majorities like March 14 is getting 17 seats in the use against two for March 8. In the Bika you, you have a bit of competition but actually March 8 is getting all the seats in uh, Baalbaq and Hermel and March 14 is getting the seats in the other districts, Zahle and uh, Rashaya. Uh, in Mount Lebanon, uh, Aoun is getting 21 seats against 14 seats for March 18. North Lebanon, uh, March 14, sorry, is getting the majority of the seats. South Lebanon, they are only getting two seats in Saida. This is where Kabiri comes from, against 21 seats for Hezbollah. So, uh, and uh, of Doha, uh, Doha, uh, Doha agreement resulted in uh, elections that led to uh, a new March 14 majority against March 8, March 8 minority within the parliament until uh, PM Wadi Jumdat uh, sold his party, so he is the one who is mostly in this color, okay? He dissolved uh, his party and uh, he uh, joined the coalition of March 8th and this is when the, uh, the majority in the parliament were to change again in favor of Hezbollah 
and they obtained a cabinet that is now running Lebanon uh, uh, that was presented as the cabinet uh, in favor of Hezbollah. Uh, to uh, finish my presentation, uh, I would like to uh, give you a small conclusion that is related to the Arab Revolution's implications on the Lebanese fragmented geography. Um, we have noticed recently the formation of a current that is advocating the choice of neutrality. And uh, this is led by the President of the Republic, uh, Prime Minister Riccati, and uh, uh, um, uh, Nabil Bernie from Amal Wali Jumblad. Uh, political tension has increased between the opponents in the parliament. We have uh, witnessed that during the parliamentary uh, discussions preceding the vote of confidence. Striking contrast between the calm in the streets and the rage between the politicians. Uh, we have noted that capsizing Syrian regime appeared uh, to the people we have interviewed determinant for Lebanese politics. Among the Christian partisan of FPM, Mainstream comments was to worry on their faith community as a regional minority in the Levant. Uh, the new regional equation affected identity awareness among faith communities in Lebanon, whereas people did not anymore identify with regional majorities but felt rather confined in the Lebanese national pluralism. Interviewees who were supposed to have broad national vision based their argumentations on sectarian perceptions rather than national ideas or cross-sectarian coalitions. A sense of ascription was also heightened by the interviews where it appeared that territorial practices have also changed. Uh, this was my presentation for today. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. I guess we are going to open it to the questions, comments, Yeah. yeah, you mentioned about the striking contrast between the people and the politicians there at the end. Yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that and uh, the consequences in a, in a democratic system of uh, that contrast? Yes. Um, actually, uh, first of all, I would like to tell you why am I speaking about uh, that. Okay. Thank you for your question because it will allow me to elaborate because this was my third uh, survey my latest street survey in uh, August uh, 2011. Actually, um, uh, during the uh, parliamentary uh, discussion preceding um, the vote for confidence, um, uh, po political uh, hatred was heightened inside the parliament. Some politicians insulted each other, even accusations were very uh, severe. and. Um, the opposition uh, left the parliament before the vote of, uh, of confidence was made. So this is how, how uh, tense the situation was inside the parliament. Uh, meanwhile, at the same time, I was uh, observing the streets of Beirut and I could see that it was relaxed more than usual, very suspicious. Usually people in Beirut are very tense when we have political uh, tensions or, um, you know, um, uh, rendezvous, you know, uh, waiting for something to happen. And um, I had uh, to uh, consider at that point that I had no a priori hypothesis to work on. And this is when I went to speak to my first informant to understand what was happening. And actually I realized that people were having a great dissolution of uh, war and of fighting. It was clearly expressed. Um, I didn't understand what was the cause, so I, I went to investigate to understand if uh, there was a relation, a correlation with the Arab revolutions. But actually, if, um, I, I let me tell you, give you an example of uh, someone uh, of, uh, Okay, so I will give you an illustration of people remarks. Uh, so, uh, Hamad is a senior driver who lives in Tariq Jadida. So this is one of the uh, one of the neighborhoods where you have uh, not a mixed neighborhood, but where you have 
uh, street crashes frequently. His wife is a Shiite and his mother is a Palestinian from Bush Barajni refugee camp. Hamad used to be inflamed with politics and he had divorced his wife twice for political discord over the Sunni Shiite quarrels in the street of Beirut. In August 2011, he did not answer any of the political questions. We have nothing to win from these disputes, madam. Look at them using the people, filling in their pockets, driving fancy cars, and traveling abroad whenever tension is getting into the streets. I personally am planning to find a job abroad and start saving for my children. This is not, was not an unusual remark uh, from the people I have interviewed, but it, because these people, I knew them before, and because um, I am used to them to be very inflamed in political debate, um, they were, in their speech, reflecting what I was observing in the streets. And this was very puzzling. I didn't understand, because the politicians who do represent them were not having the same discourse or the same behavior. So, uh, uh, I uh, tried to understand what was the relation between this new state of mind and the Arab revolution, just to see if there was any uh, correlation between the two. And actually, um, I could see that the people did not uh, perceive the Arab revolutions as we uh, expect them to do so from far away, from Singapore with the Western mentality. Um, the only uh, people who did idealize uh, not idealized, who did at least consider that those were revolutions, were people aged between 30 and 40 years old, highly educated, um, saying that, okay, you need to have uh, the cows, but at the end, these are revolutions, these are for people are asking, seeking for democracy, etc. But uh, as I was interviewing people from lower, uh, lower, height, uh, lower uh, social classes and people uh, uh, who are uh, political actors, uh, the perception of uh, what we call Arab revolutions was troubled. Those were not revolutions. Those were, uh, uh, like, I have one uh, that can illustrate this to you. Um, oh. Sorry. Um, someone who told me, we are so full with political garbage, together with the Arab world, they want freedom and equality. Where? In Yemen. And in Libya. I wish they asked us how much troubles and civil unrest could make the fight for democracy. So people are very disillusioned uh, very disillusioned with the outcome of, uh, of war. Yeah? And they tend to prefer peace or um, uh, calm and security to, uh, to uh, violent uh, chaos, violent clashes, uh, and ask for uh, democracy or for freedom. And um, um, also, okay, you can mention a lot of uh, conspiracy theory, of course, um, political agenda running uh, through uh, the Arab world, etc. But mainly, uh, what I could, from the majority of the people, I could perceive a lot of worries. Uh, worries on their future, worries on, uh, on uh, insecurity getting into Lebanon. So, uh, in the democratic system, how could, uh, could, what could be the implications of this state of mind? Uh, I cannot uh, tell you. I can tell you uh, what's happening now in uh, Lebanon. So after uh, I was back, uh, um, the it seems to me that uh, the, uh, the political players are dragging uh, the people uh, with their decisions to where they might not want to get. Uh, so, uh, we have recently, for example, the Christian Patriarch uh, who has declared that he is in favor of the Syrian regime because the Syrian regime is protecting the Christian minorities in the Levant, uh, the minorities and the Christians uh, in the Levant. 
and he has attracted uh, the Salafi uh, violent retaliation, at least in the discourse, uh, by taking such a, a statement without mentioning the Western world uh, reacting to this position. But in the internal uh, uh, Lebanese configuration, it's a much dramatic, uh, 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 dramatic statement because uh, the Lebanese Christians were with the uh, own aligned with Hezbollah and Jaja aligned with March 14, where the Christians were neutralizing their position in case of a clash between the Sunni and the Shiites. And with uh, the Patriarch making such a statement, you would believe that together with own they are putting all the Christian eggs in the same basket. So uh, such a statement would be, or and the implication of such a statement could be, uh, uh, could have uh, more dramatic consequences on the ground uh, and much earlier than the next elections that can uh, that are expected to 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 come in four years. From now. Yes. Well, I, I find this extraordinary, and I thank you very much for mm -hmm. it. I, I, of course, I mean, I think. That the, the sort of basic fact of Lebanese politics is that the status quo has to be guaranteed by some strong outside power. Yes. And at the moment, um, I mean, to put it very crudely, they, they cannot rely on the Syrians, or the, the, the situation vis-à-vis -vis the Syrians is so uncertain that, uh, no, to crude say, but they don't really know what to do, mm -hmm. I guess. And so, um, I mean, it, it, and, and of course, you know, we can go on guessing indefinitely whether, you know, whether the Assad regime will stay or fall. But um, if it falls, it seems to me the the consequences for Lebanon are quite considerable in the sense that uh, it's likely to bring about very considerable uh, disorder. On the other hand, as you say, there will be people in Lebanon that think, you, you know, down with dictatorship. Uh, so, but this is the patriarch, this is just absolutely wonderful that there's the patriarch defending mm -hmm. Assad, but of course he would. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's so paradoxical. I mean, sometimes, I, I mean, you know, sometimes you look at Lebanese history, you think, so, why on earth is this group with that group all of a sudden? And you suddenly realize, oh yes, because you know that that if you see round the corner far enough, that that, that uh, this is how this is how they have to be. But the picture of it is very old. The year has been replaced been recently, been and the new one is from that region where Oman is getting uh, the high number of well, the north. He, no, uh, he, has he, uh, he is. Uh, he used to be. I don't know if he originally from there, but he used to be the Bakra. Uh, uh, no, not the Bakra. The bishop, I mean, uh, Bishop. Ebek. Uh, of uh, this. Uh, this region. So this is where he is coming from. Uh, actually, just uh, not to, because this is a comment, but just to add to, to your comment. Uh, yes, we uh, tend to believe that statu quo is ensured in Lebanon by outside power. However, not only by the Syrians. Uh, previously, uh, we uh, had uh, a Syrian-Saudi uh, deal over Lebanon. And this was, was to guarantee the stability of uh, Lebanon. And this is when we uh, considered that, um, and this is when even the International Tribunal fight was put on the side. Uh, it, it happened uh, last summer, actually. And uh, so, saying that the Saudis are the patron of the Sunnis, in Lebanon, the Syrians of the Shiite axis in Lebanon, Hezbollah uh, coalition with uh, with Aoun. So, um, if they can get to an agreement, then we can all get uh, to, an, to an agreement together. Um, Syria to alone today cannot uh, disturb uh, Lebanon to a certain extent directly because the 
the Lebanese security system is not anymore uh, infiltrated by the Syrian uh, security system as much as before. Uh, but of course, Syrian stability will or instability will affect directly uh, Lebanese uh, balance and uh, security. Uh, and uh, we have, can, can I show you something again? Uh, I would like to show you this map of the Lebanese clashes. based 
on uh, the vision um, uh, for now it's a common vision that fighting against Israel maintaining Hezbollah resistance and uh, consolidating um, the position of uh, the Christians in Lebanon those who are considered to have uh, um, lost the civil war and uh, with uh, Taif Accord yes? so um, um, uh, identification with Hezbollah uh, is not anymore uh, of a religious kind uh, not only, of course, you have people who, who have this vision, but support uh, it, but uh, not anymore. It, it, it is more of uh, a nationalist kind. Uh, and they are the only people who can defend the nation. Uh, they are the only people, not who can defend uh, the nation, they are the only people who can resist Israel. That's what, that's what. This is a yeah. nuance because yeah. uh, um, actually. It was a mistake uh, from Hezbollah to go into street clashes in May 7 and use his weaponry in the streets of Beirut. This is what, I, okay, what we have seen together and this is when uh, he was dragged into internal street fighting and into uh, becoming a militia rather than a uh, resistance. This is what they want to avoid. Actually, uh, also what I'm saying in the paper is that you know, in the conclusion, I told you there is a, a, a sense of ascription and the higher and the territorial practices have changed. Actually, uh, ethnic groups now in Lebanon have a very high awareness of their territories. And uh, there is now a national dispute over a very small village called Lhasa. This one? Yeah. The, uh, you have an old church that is being used by Muslim sheikh for Muslim prayers, and uh, <laughs> instead of being seen as dialogue between the cultures, now it's being seen as the Shiites are taking, uh, are occupying the Christian land in Biblos. And clearly, this was pronounced by a speech of Hassan Nasrallah. He said. They speak about the dispute over Lhasa as if it were the holy church of the Kudus. Lhasa is a small village in the city of Biblos, and there is a disagreement between the people of Lhasa and Lebanese Patriarch or Maronite Church. They exaggerated this matter, and they accused Hezbollah and expanded by accusing the Shiites, and they said that the Shiites in Biblos are occupying the territories of the Christians. This was the language that March 14 used. This is an old issue dating back before the High Shiite Council was put in place. It is a judicial issue, but the speech said two Christians of Lebanon are being targeted. This is a very unusual way of talking by Hassan Nasrallah. He tends not to name uh, the, the faith communities, he tends not to talk about religious or regional uh, appartenance. And this is how. Uh, marked by uh, sectarianism in speech was. Yeah. yeah, I'm very struck by your, um, your point that Hassan Nasrallah can mobilize people beyond just the, uh, the Muslim circles, kind of. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and you talk about the, how he's a master rhetorician. Uh, rhetorician. Yeah. Yep. So um, I just want to ask you, because I'm reminded of uh, uh, Navid's presentation, Work in Progress, when he talks about Iranian spring movement and he talks about how uh, it latches on to the, uh, the rhetoric of democracy, you know, and you know, change from within. And I'm just wondering that um, whether instead of just using uh, Israel as a common enemy, you know, uh, Hezbollah as the um, as the um, as the only defender of uh, you know Le Lebanon from an outside oppressor, does it also uh, latch on to rhetoric of? Uh, uh, you know, freedom, democracy, that, are, that is seen yeah. to be... Uh, okay, yeah. uh, and then uh, just to uh, follow up on that, uh, does it still use the rhetoric of uh, Islamist uh, ideas of the Islamic State, for example, or Darul Haq versus Darul Islam, stuff like that? Okay. And how does this, uh, you know, interplay with the whole... His okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, um, uh, all the questions are very interesting. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, I'm addressing them uh, properly. 
Um, okay, the rhetoric. Yes, Hassan Nasrallah uh, has a nationalist perspective. He called, uh, he called for, for, for example, a just and clean state. Uh, he has a speech that is uh, going uh, uh, anti-corruption speech. Okay, uh, in internal issues, he has he addresses a lot of social uh, issues that are disturbing the Lebanese uh, society. Most of the time, of course, he is defending the social rights of his community, the Shiit, but at, uh, not, uh, in the way he communicates about them, he is not saying, for example, like Musa Sadr, uh, I don't know if you are familiar with him, he is the one who has consolidated the Shiit uh, identity, religious identity, as a faith community, community and I mean, political one uh, in Lebanon. Musa Sadr, if you compare the speeches of Musa Sadr to Hassan al-Sallam, clearly Musa Sadr uh, addressed the shape of Lebanon as we. Hassan al-Sallam, when he says we, it's not only the shape of Lebanon, it's not only Hezbollah. He is addressing all those who would like to feel that they are included by the we. It's very open, actually. And um, uh, so when he is addressing uh, 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 the so social uh, social uh, issues that are being faced by the Shiite community, in Arabic, these are the affairs of the people, like that they have electricity, that they have water, food, schools, access to schools. Do we have enough places in the prison? For example, this has generated a huge crisis this year, 2011, with demonstrations, strikes, confrontations, because we had no, not enough places in the prisons, but most of the people in the prisons are from the Shia community. So, so uh, and uh, anyway, uh, and during the winter, for example, uh, the heating, the problem of heating in the periphery, you know, this kind uh, of things. And uh, or, so, and he addresses um, ideas for a nation. Most of the time, it's about clean nation, strong nation, not corrupt it's a nation that stands for its principles. Comparing, uh, not, not only criticizing uh, the Lebanese government, but also criticizing the Arab regime. And uh, calling the Arab people uh, to uh, to gather for stronger food. Um, uh, so he has a nationalist discourse, and he is close to uh, the people's struggles. Um, he also ha he is still using uh, a reference to Islam. Uh, so you have several kinds of speeches. Yes. Like you have the speeches that are occurring during religious uh, occasions, Ashura, okay? Every day you would have a prayer and uh, a, a preaching, uh, not pre preaching, but you know, it's uh, the, the, the discourse you would have in Ashura is different from the one you would have at the political occasion, yes? But if you take, to stay uh, in our uh, subject, uh, and a pure example, the speech he had pronounced on that day, uh, the Divine Victory Rally on the 27th, 2nd of September. Mm -hmm. So you can see it's a divine victory. Mm -hmm. So clearly in the speech, it, there was reference to the help of God for, uh, for this uh, victory. Um, and uh, there was reference to Mujahideen, um, uh, okay, which is clearly those uh, who fight. Uh, for martyrship, okay. and then uh, also you had the reference to uh, nationalism. Okay, so um, sometimes you have reference to Hassan and Hussein. It depends on the occasion. It depends on the problem. Uh, it might occur. Uh, for example, one of their slogans at one point was "I have been Abdullah. So we will be never uh, humiliated again. Uh, Hassan, uh, the end, they were crying, we will never leave the Hassan and Hussein uh, again. We will not, not let them die, die again. And this was a period where they had a deep crisis with the Sunnis. So, <laughs> you should write a book on that. Yeah. I just have a, a brief question. Um, it's about one of the 
the themes that was covered in your, in your abstract, but I'm not sure how yeah. uh, if it was carried into the presentation. And that's the suggestion that um, the alliance that uh, that was formed between uh, Hezbollah and, and Aoun was not just in a historical vacuum, but there was actually a deep history of cohabitation yes. between those two groups. Yes. Can you elaborate a little bit yes. on that? Uh, sorry, aspect? I couldn't elaborate on this aspect in the presentation. That is very true. Thank you for asking the question. Yes. Um, actually, the uh, historic uh, good vicinity relation uh, did exist between the Shiite and the Maronite in North Lebanon. Uh, there is, uh, uh, in the history of Lebanon, in the common, uh, common discourse, we tend to forget about uh, the Shiite Imara, Imara that, was, uh, that used to exist uh, throughout uh, Mount Lebanon and that was... Yeah? Is that her food? Uh, uh, but but, but uh, I am... Oh, um, I know very well the period by Hamadi. I'm not familiar with the period by the Hafush, so I cannot. Uh, but uh, the, Hama the Hamadi did, uh, were the last uh, governance, shared governance of this Imara in the region of Mount Lebanon. And uh, actually, uh, uh, the reason why uh, they couldn't hold their uh, Imara is not because they had uh, 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 disputes with, uh, with their Maronite peasants at the time, or Vassal, or, uh, uh, it's because they were overloaded with debts, and the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire was, uh, uh, um, and the pressure over them by the Ottoman Empire was increasing, they couldn't go to the justice courts uh, in Tripoli and uh, in the justice courts held by the Ottoman Empire to defend their rights and they used as mediators uh, the Maronites and this is when there was um, a social transformation whereas uh, they were indebted, indebted uh, uh, for the Maronite community and at the point there was a social transformation and um, they uh, sold out their lands and new uh, nobles, uh, Maronite no nobles, uh, came in in this, in this very region of village Bay, yes, and the surrounding. Um, um, historically, you have, uh, of course, Lebanon has witnessed uh, sect uh, sectarian, regularly sectarian uh, fights, but uh, historically, uh, uh, we have witnessed in this region good between relativity uh, relations and uh, also that were preserved throughout the time. During the Lebanese Civil War, the shield of who stayed uh, in that region uh, following the uh, fall of the Imara of Hamadi were never displaced. They were never disturbed in the practices of their cults, for example. And um, uh, uh, the squat, Lhasa and Akha, were never bothered. You can imagine, I'm talking about a period of time when people were filled on, based on their identity cards. And you have a whole region where an indigenous shared minority could, could stay, keep its name, practice its faith, this is a very important detail. In Afa, uh, you have also uh, common uh, habits. In Afa, you have a temple that is called Adonis uh, Temple, so inherited temple. Shiites and Maronites from uh, Afa and from uh, surrounding village would come and uh, make vows for Adonis to have children. So uh, they have common customs. Yes, that have nothing to do with their uh, uh, different uh, religions. And um, lately also, um, a problem occurred, for example, in, uh, between Afa and neighboring village uh, called Monetara. And so you can imagine, um, there is a touristic uh, site, the girls were hanging around, they shared boys throw uh, uh, 
Stones. Stones. Uh, and then the girls went back. They told the guys. The guys went back. Beat the shit. The shit wanted to kill the guy. So who did intervene? Uh, the um, uh, the dad of uh, the two villages, and then the MPs of the two regions. So we didn't have to go to Pensbala or to go. So this, oh, of course, these are it's anecdotal the way I'm putting it, but. Throughout the history, you have a preservation of common costumes, of good vicinity relations uh, that are still uh, regulating uh, their uh, life. So, so it's just a brief follow-up question. So did the leaders of the two political camps, you know, Michelle Aoun and uh, Yang Hassan Nasrallah and their political associates evoke this history of peaceful coexistence and mutual accommodation to justify their alliance and to make the case that their shared interests vastly superseded any differences that were present between them? Yeah, okay. Um, you are pinpointing maybe the weakness of my uh, work because uh, uh, I don't know to what extent uh, they rely on these historic uh, relations in the discourse. But uh, actually, uh, they they use them as an evidence uh, to uh, they use the human solidarity and social the revealed social network as an evidence for them to uh, build a grounded uh, a more grounded alliance. But uh, and and they used it for them, meaning they had the insurance that people would accept this kind of alliance. Because also, thank you for this question, uh, there is a wider uh, social acceptance between the Sheikh and the Maronites, let's say, than uh, between an Orthodox and the Sheikh. Meaning, um, they come from, they have social organizations and social structures uh, that have something in common between them, so they can understand how it works socially, okay, which is not the case, which wouldn't be the case between the, let's say, the, the orthodox citizen of Beirut and the Shia coming from, coming from South Lebanon. So when they mingle, they are more more likely to to have affinities in, in that term, uh, at the mass level, but um, because they have more of a clanic organization, and this is the case also for the Maronites, etc. Um, but it was never, I, I, I can't say it was never mentioned, because I didn't look at it like that, but I, I'm not aware that it was mentioned in their speech or in their discourse. We have always been, uh, we have always had uh, good vicinity relations. So this communitarian typical perspective, Shia, Maronite, and let's get together. I don't, I don't think that they address it that way. They were more ambitious. Uh, so they wanted to address it at the national level. Plus, uh, thank you for asking the question. This uh, Imara that I'm talking about has been uh, not erased from history, but it's not remembered. Why? Because the Shiites have a more recent memory of victimization with uh, Imam Musa Sadr. And uh, the Jews and the Christians are very happy with the version of uh, Imara and Zia. Yes? So, in, uh, so I don't know to what extent they would go back to write history. And... Thank you. Yes? Thank you. Thank you. Um, first question uh, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, research procedure? The, yes. the the nature of the interview is a sample or whatever it might have been. Uh, and then I'm, uh, I'm trying to uh, grasp from this very interesting expose sort of where Lebanon stands right now. And I wondered if, if you could elaborate any more on one conclusion that I think I have drawn from this, which is that the Christian community of Lebanon uh, is hopelessly uh, divided and fragmented. It seems as if uh, there are Christian personalities on all sides now. Uh, if you have if you have the Maronite patriarch, uh, 
so many ironies here, uh, with Nasrallah, with Bashar al-Assad uh, on one side. And uh, if you have uh, Christian leaders that I don't think you made much mention of, uh, who would have been with Karnat uh, Chahwan or with the, uh, with the uh, March 14th group, on another side, and then in the middle, you have uh, this, uh, this trio of leaders that you alluded to, and which you mentioned in a previous piece that you wrote for us, as sort of the hope for keeping Lebanon from totally exploding, a kind of third force in the middle, which consists of the President of the Republic, who is a Christian, who has no discernible following at all, and no particular political skills, it's like I can observe. Um, you have the Prime Minister, Prati, who uh, has no particular constituency of his own, uh, uh, but he seems to be a stalking horse for Hezbollah, therefore is, cannot be on very good terms with the larger Sunni community, which is mostly, I suppose, represented by another inadequate leader named Saad Hariri, uh, but who has a very powerful backer in Saudi Arabia. And, and so I, I guess what I'm getting at is, uh, A, uh, would you agree with my overstated conclusion that the Christians have basically kind of lost uh, any kind of communal clout uh, that they uh, might have had, and B, that the country is in really bad shape, that, that, uh, and, and a lot of it could hinge on what happens in Damascus. If, if, if the Shah Asset goes down, um, where does that leave his erstwhile uh, clients and allies and friends in, uh, in Lebanon? And does this open the way for uh, some kind of uh, explosion of Sunni radicalism and militancy that we have not seen before, and would certainly not be pleasing to the Saudis, but it might happen anyway. Okay. Uh, let me start with the research procedure. Okay. Um, I would like to thank Nambi because in the beginning he said that I have. I'm using actually my observations during the July war uh, when I was a war reporter. But also, um, I, I was lucky and I was sponsored by the Middle East Institute to go, to, uh, to go back to the field after six months of research in July, August 2011. And this is when, uh, as soon as I got uh, to Beirut, I have realized that um, at first sight, by intuition, um, all what I have expected was not there. And this is when I have realized that uh, I couldn't work on a hypothetic uh, first conclusion to start my field research. So um, what I did, um, I went for a qualitative survey and um, I uh, used the following technique, okay? Uh, first of all, um, I designed the, sur the design of the survey was, was done in the field. So the sampling was not predetermined and no use of statistics has been made before attacking the field. Uh, to gradually build this sample, I had to first choose the center central informants in what is called the exploratory phase. This early, so I got my first, my early stories, and they dealt with the description of individual experiences. So, uh, because I, I needed to get, again, a sense of what's happening. Okay? In this exploratory phase, the first interview's main function was to highlight the changes that occurred in personal lives after the Arab Revolution. Their revelations served as first to raise the first questions to debate in a group using the technique of snowball sampling. So actually, uh, I went from first uh, informants to group, to group 
uh, introduced. So they um, actually, I used my first informants to elaborate the first question I would debate in group interviews. And uh, I elaborated the group uh, interviews using the snowball sampling. The group interview is usually a method of maintaining a focus on experience of all respondents and where the development of research hypothesis is conceived as a joint production process. Usually it's over the disagreement in a group, in a group interview that we notice what are the sensitive points. And th these are the points that we would uh, elaborate then on, uh, personally with each one that participated uh, in the group uh, interview. So of course I had also, this is the, the survey uh, overall, and uh, I had also to resource to the archives, etc. and to the field observation mainly in these two regions, Lata and Afa, and uh, surrounding villages. Um, to answer your last question, which is what happens uh, if uh, asset uh, falls? I won't answer. I will answer through my interview, yes. I will uh, uh, answer... Uh, your, your interviewees are, <coughs> are they're, they're all Christians. Yes. And, uh, uh, yes. And, okay. and, and since it's a study that, that is trying to ascertain the nature of Christian perceptions yes. of Hezbollah, I'm wondering um, how, you know, I understand the technique you just described, but uh, do you think you had a representative sample of Christians? That is um, to say, there are surely some that, that yeah. find uh, own no, uh, alliance as being self-serving and, no. and wrong. Uh, because I'm also focused on uh, FBM uh, partisans. But uh, no, uh, definitely it doesn't represent the Christians because I didn't interview those from Colonel Chermain and March 14. I interviewed people who are not with Hezbollah and home, but who are not with March 14. Look, I interviewed the partisans and the neutrals. I didn't uh, get uh, to interview uh, the others. Uh, um, it, it gives a sense. It, it doesn't pretend to represent, uh, you know, like when you have uh, a quantitative survey statistics and then you go for qualitative. It, it's, it's not, it's not that. It gives a sense, actually. Um, now, if uh, I would like to speak through the neutral political players, okay? Um, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, my interviewees uh, uh, wanted to get to speak. They wanted to keep uh, anonymous. So uh, this is one for a previous minister, close to the president of the republic and uh, uh, who is in favor of the uh, neutrality access. He told me that we worry tremendously about Syria. Syria destiny will surely affect Lebanese politics. I personally support the Lebanese access of neutrality. Remember, the Shiite access will never bother American regional strategies as much as a strong Sunni Pan-Arab alliance. Christians might dream of Arab nationalism. Shiite might fight for it, but organically and demographically, Arab nationalism is Sunni or will never be. Therefore, I am confident that in the course of Arab revolt, the U.S. will work hard on keeping the ceiling of similar dreams low, especially in the Gulf, by supporting the monarchies. Um, actually, uh, it maybe answers a little bit about uh, the explosion of Sunni uh, radicalism. Like, this is an opinion that uh, uh, you know, this is someone who thinks that whatever happens, okay, they might, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, of course, Hezbollah will be weakened or will have, go through uh, tremendous difficulties after the fall of Syria, but there is no way, in this person's opinion, that Sunni radicalism could uh, rule uh, over uh, the Levant. Um, another uh, interviewee, uh, over the Syrian uh, uh, situation, a Lebanese interviewee, a Christian partisan of FPM. Uh, she told me, we worry about Syria's future because we worry about minorities. So I asked her why. She said, it's obvious, while well, our Syrian regime is a pro-minority and has always supported Christians in Lebanon. 
if extremist Muslimi was to govern Syria, we will get affected. So I told her, don't you think that peace communities should stay out of Syrian national struggles and that it would be harmful to think as a regional minority? And she said, indeed, this would be the case if we were in Switzerland. But Syria has always had a seizure over Lebanon, and whoever will be in power in Syria will get involved in Lebanese politics. I will not continue, but this is a, a very striking comment. These are people who used to support someone who was fighting against the same uh, Syrian regime occupying Lebanon. And suddenly, this is, this is what we get uh, as a response. It's very... It's amazing, and soon after we have the patriarch who is making the same statement, so I don't, don't tell me to uh, try to explain more. But uh, also I would like to tell you about Syrian people I have met that I didn't mention in my paper. Uh, I met people, uh, Syrian people from uh, the previous opposition, the traditional opposition, opposition uh, against uh, Assad family, and people who are not involved in politics but who belong to the old bourgeoisie, but who definitely are not pro Assad. And uh, both were very uncertain about the nature of the opposition in Syria. Very suspicious, very, uh, uh, very uh, worried about uh, uh, Syria uh, divides, uh, a plan to divide uh, Syria like in Iraq. It was very recurrent, recurrent in their, uh, in their uh, answers. Um, I even heard uh, someone wrote to me actually by email, this is a revolution of the mosque. And he is a secular uh, Syrian from uh, the opposition. So I, I, it's only anecdotic, anecdotic because I didn't make a, a survey. But from the people I have met and I have uh, talked to, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty about the nature of the opposition and what would happen uh, to Syria proper. Um, the consequence over uh, Lebanon, um, the statements of the people of Colonel Shahmain um, and uh, the Christian allies of March 14, Ja'na Amini made a statement answering back the patriarch. He said, you are behaving as if all the Sunni were Salafi. And uh, this should not be uh, the case. You should uh, trust uh, the Syrian national struggle and you should trust uh, to have uh, Sunni allies, etc. If you are interested, I can get uh, the detailed statement for you. Um, uh, uh, mainly, uh, for March 14, uh, in its media is attacking the Syrian regime directly. They are denouncing the uh, they are denouncing the um, exaggeration of the Syrian regime, the crimes, etc. Uh, arms uh, smuggling is being routed from Lebanon to Syria. Uh, it's I mean, on the uh, national news agency, it's not nothing that is being, uh, it's not a rumor. Uh, but we don't know who is uh, providing the weapon to which Syrians, actually. Um, if you ask me for my personal opinion, um, my answer is I don't know, because we're still in the course of the action. Every day we have a surprise, so we, it's very difficult to, to say. But actually we have signs that if it happens that way, this is how we would uh, elaborate the scenario. So if you have a Sunni Shiite clash, uh, we can configure the scenario on uh, Lebanese geography. On, uh, we can map it. If you uh, say uh, Sunni radicalism would uh, retaliate, mainly it will attack uh, the Christian regions in Lebanon. Like, uh, it happened uh, when uh, the, after Khalili assassina was assassinated, most of the attacks that occurred in Lebanon occurred in the Christian regions. Until Aung signed the agreement with the Hezbollah. I hope that. No questions? No, I have no, no questions.
question, just a comment. Uh, I want to echo what Professor Sladet said, and uh, I enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments, questions? If I may, uh, I want to make an observation and comment. You showed in this slide a picture that represented originality, genius yeah. quality or aspect of uh, Castro law support. Yes. And it's fascinating and we can find echo of that in many different cultures and societies, how women become the site of cultural contestation. So in this slide you are showing women who are involved in the principle of masculinity and actually fight for embodying the principle of so-called femininity and you, you character as sexy and you you are you, you have uh, other women's typical supporters so i just want to know if you have any uh, you know, part of your paper dedicated to this gender aspect of this heterogeneity uh, uh, and uh, matthew talked about how principles of democratic, democratic movement and desires are so obviously this is a, uh, have you put these pictures together? Yes. Are this, yes. Uh, is there a, an effort on the last uh, campaign to show how they have been able to mobilize all these different segments of the society to women? And if so, when it comes to political mobilization, they are using it. But when, what about when it comes to distribution of Let's say power, economy, and politics. Okay, thank you. Uh, I didn't focus on American women, on gender. Uh, yeah, it's not a gender perspective, but I interviewed a lot of women, and they have, they are uh, speak, speak, given the They speak in my uh, paper. Um, <coughs> actually, uh, uh, okay, um, in uh, Nasrallah's. Uh, discourse, um, women, uh, uh, I didn't analyze it specifically from that perspective, but uh, mainly, uh, okay, I will not say talk from that perspective, but I will talk from the perspective of the interviewees that you may uh, Okay, uh, uh, some women in, of my interviewees who are Muslim support Hassan Nasrallah partly because uh, the Shiites. They consider that the Shiites are better with the women than the Sunnis. Okay, so this is a typical, well, a clear answer I had uh, one time from uh, a woman. Um, in on Manak TV, uh, women uh, do present programs, do read the news. Uh, uh, in the Hezbollah organization, they participate fully. Shiite women work, but they were great. So, uh, um, uh, socially, the rumor is that uh, they are more em emancipated than uh, the Christians. So. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, uh, okay, uh, it's an anecdote. The, actually, uh, concentration of women couples, women homosexual couples, is entire in that region. It's very funny. It's in the in Hezbollah bastion and, uh, in South Lebanon. Okay, this is where we have uh, uh, the most of uh, Hezbollah uh, military bastion, social networks, what what have you. And this is where is concentrated uh, the women uh, commu lesbian uh, community. They have their hotels. They organize their festivals. Etc. <laughs> very uh, comfortable, openly. very openly, but actually it is uh, maybe so much uns unsuspected, yes? So they are not identified as such, but they are important figures in the city. Because they are, they are very active in the civil society, very respected, but, uh, and they live together, they have projects together. But they are not, uh, you know, wearing the flag, flag or. But um, contrary 
uh, you know, this, uh, I'm just going to go back to the slides. Uh, this one, this is what we used to, uh, this is how we used to figure out this one now, uh, more than a decade ago. But, uh, but now it's not the case anymore. Uh, but it would be interesting to analyze in uh, national last speech, uh, the feminine, uh, feminine role. In the society, uh, she is the mother of the Bachi. She has a very important role in Hezbollah society, the, uh, in the society of the Mukawama, the Rishiskan society, because she is the one who sends her son to die yeah, and who accepts the idea of death. So uh, and this is very important. But uh, uh, I, I didn't uh, <laughs> We still have about 10 minutes if there is any question, please. Yeah. Uh, in case Israel and Palestine, uh, they, they go to war. Can you guess, you know, uh, what is his will not be doing? Yes. You will start. How? <laughs> when Hamas launched the first rocket, I don't know. But we now know that uh, Hezbollah has uh, developed a weaponry uh, that can target uh, up to 250 kilometers the Israeli territory. We know also that Israel is developing now the anti uh, missile that they suspect Hezbollah to, to have. Because they were quite surprised with not only how much sophisticated, but how much weapon Hezbollah had. Like, they didn't suspect they might have 4,000 Katyushas or as much uh, anti-tank missiles. But, uh, uh, no, I can't guess if uh, Hezbollah would uh, stand on the side. <laughs> You can maybe. Well, thank you very much. It was an amazingly rich presentation and as everybody enjoyed it. And please stay around. We have some type of question outside and if you have more questions, you can talk to them later. Thank you.